make it to the next election. We, 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 we may not make it to the next month. You may not make it home. Bible says the devil's like a roaring lion looking for who he can devour. Someone said lions roar when they're hungry. And I believe the enemy is hungry in this season. Hungry to take down whatever he can take down. It's vital for him to feed. <laughs> it's vital for him to win something. This is his last chance, last opportunity. And his first target is the church. And his first target is the leadership of that church to bring them down. Now, I don't know that I'm, I'm not going to do like point one, point two, point three today. I, I just got to talk from my heart if that's okay. Come on, come on, church. And, 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 and the scriptures God gave me this week and next week, I guess it's a two-sermon thing, and then we'll preach. Oh, I can't wait to get to the Christmas message. And next week's worshiping in the fire. But today I want to talk about Daniel's prayer. And the Lord began to download on me because, you, you know, we, we've been talking really for even before COVID about Babylon and the church having to go into captivity because of our disobedience. And I think, I think the Lord is trying to shake the church and wake up the church. And COVID did that. Of course, it shook off a lot of dead limbs. Not so much here, but in a lot of places, a lot of dead limbs fell off. But the good limbs are here. That's where you say amen. <laughs> I got to give you instruction. So I, realized, I went through Daniel's prayer, and I'm going to read it in a little bit, and it's a little bit lengthy, right? But we need to hear the word, and we need to hear his prayer. Because the prayer that Daniel prayed about coming out of Babylon and realizing that it was a season where that was going to happen, and he might have been instrumental in it happening, and we realize we are in a similar season where the church is coming out of darkness. I, I think it's already out all over the world, but we're still hiding out here in America. And in Europe, in all the civilized countries, there's this, you know, still holding back. D Daniel, if you, if you don't know his story, uh, Daniel was among the first captives that the Babylonians took. You know, there was two different uh, invasions. And he was among the first group. It was like, 200 young men, good-looking guys, smart, intelligent, young people that they took to Babylon, and they were going to turn them into model Babylonian citizens. And they were going to be uh, in, in the leadership, so to speak. I mean, there were slaves, but they were, uh, going, they were going to be important because they were intelligent, smart-looking, uh, well-adjusted people. So Daniel was taken as a captive when he was 15 years old. And he served four different kings from Nebuchadnezzar to Belteshazzar to Darius and finally Cyrus who released them. He lived in the king's court in Babylon for 67 years. Somebody tell me how long the captivity was supposed to last. 70 years. He didn't realize it during all those years. He is now 82 years old, which is a long, he was an old guy especially for that time when a lot of people died in their 30s. He was an old guy, lived in the Babylonian court for 67 years. 
He's a testament to the fact that you can be completely surrounded by alien indoctrination and lies and all kinds of Babylonian gods and still serve Jehovah. Come on, church. And still serve Jehovah. At his 67th year, he received a revelation by reading the book of Jeremiah. And in the book of Jeremiah, it said that 70 years are determined upon God's people. And suddenly Daniel realized that in three years, God's people would begin to be able to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. Daniel would never go back. But Daniel realized it. Oh, church. You know, sometimes you've got to realize, even though you don't see it, you need to pray so your children will see it. This thing's generational. Moses never did get to the promised land, but he made sure everyone else did. Come on, I'm talking to old people now, but hang in there. You understand what I'm saying. Listen to the story in the first chapter of Daniel beginning in verse 3. Then the king instructed, uh, Ash, Ash, I want to call him Ashpenaz, you know, the master of his eunuchs, the king's eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training, wow, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To him, to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, 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 Meshach. Y'all know those names. Isn't it strange we know their Babylonian names, not their Hebrew names? Uh, Abed, Abednego, Abednego. But Daniel purpose, say purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, church, I believe the same thing is happening to us today. We're living in what's called cancel culture, right? We're living in a time where their goal, their stated goal is to change the way we think. Their stated goal is that we are wrong and they are right. And that if you uh, persist on being a Christian, you are a bigot, you're a racist, right? Right? I mean, everybody here is a racist. Even the black people are. Because you can't be a Christian and believe like Christians believe and not be a racist because they're right and we're wrong. It's to the point where they're in charge and we're not. The culture used to be Christian, even though everyone wasn't saved, obviously, but it was a Christian culture. It is no longer a Christian culture. It is a Babylonian culture. And we have a choice to make. Are we going to stand up and stand out? Or are we going to give in and, get, and be under? We have a choice to make. And it's being forced on you at work, in the stores, at the doctor's office, you're being, you're being forced to make a choice because you can't have a conversation anymore without revealing the fact that you love Jesus. <laughs> Come on, church. 
You just can't do it anymore. You, you, you get exposed all the time. Some of you have gotten real good at being closet Christians. Now, isn't it funny that now it's the Christians that need to come out of the closet? <laughs> Everyone else is out. <laughs> Two things they did to Daniel, actually three things. N- number one, they changed their name. In other words, they changed their identity. They said, we don't want you to identify with the Hebrews anymore. We want you to identify with the Babylonians. We want you to start acting like a Babylonian and not a, not a Hebrew. We want you to start uh, behaving the way the new society wants you to behave and not the way your Christian Bible tells you to behave. Come on, church. We need to pray. There wasn't anything Daniel could do about it. They changed his name, gave him a Babylonian name. And then number two, he was put under the chief of the eunuchs. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but it's kind of obvious that if your boss is a eunuch, some of you don't even know what a eunuch is. I am not going to explain it. People are getting their phones out right now. <laughs> if you Google that, other things might come up. Be careful. So, so Daniel, and I, I, I never heard anyone preach this before, but it's kind of obvious. Daniel was probably a eunuch. He obviously never married, never had children. So in other words, they tried to change his identity, and they tried to change his purpose. They said, Daniel, whatever your dreams were in Jerusalem, those dreams are dead, and now you dream the dreams of Babylon. You may have wanted a wife and kids, but that dream is shot. You may have wanted to serve in the temple, but that dream is done. You were of the tribe of Judah, and maybe you wanted this or that, but those things are dead. And, if, and, and on Daniel, you know, I lost my identity. I lost, you know, my, my dreams and everything that I ever wanted to be. But Daniel knew something that some of us need to get a hold of, and that is you can, my identity is not in my name. My identity is in Jesus Christ, and you can't take that away from him. I am hid in Christ. They can't take your identity. They can try to change your name, put a label on you, but you know who you are. And they can say you can't do this anymore, and your dreams are shot, but I just came by to tell you. My destiny is in God. And regardless of where the world puts me, I can serve him. Are you all praying for me? Oh, Jesus. But the third thing was, they wanted him to eat the king's food. And Daniel drew a line because he says, you can change me on the outside, but I will not be defiled on the inside. (laughs) Greater is he that is. Can't change that. Can't touch that. Come on, church. The world's delicacies hoes taste so good but they're empty calories they make you feel full and happy and waste the rest of the day on the couch after your sugar crash Are you hearing what I'm saying? But they do nothing for you, your health. In fact, they work against your health. And Daniel said, I'll tell you what, Mr. Eunuch, let's do this. Let's go for, you know, some time here, and I'll eat our food. I'll eat vegetables, right? And and I'll just eat the basic stuff that we Jews can eat, and you eat all your delicacies, and then we'll see who looks better. 
That's the beginning of what's called the Daniel fast. Uh, so he eats his food, they eat their food, he, and after, after the time, they look better than the other guys. Because Daniel drew a line, even if it meant his death. He said, I, 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 listen, I can, I can live in your world, but your world can't change me. And I draw the line where I have to deny Christ. I draw the line where you tell me what I got to believe. You can't change that. I'll uh, put me in a jail cell, but you can't change what's in me. Put me, oh, hallelujah, make me a murder. Burn me at the stake, but you can't change who lives in me. Oh, glory to God. Oh, I feel the Lord in this place. Mm. So Daniel, in chapter 8, prays a prayer. When he realizes, when he realizes, my God, that, oh, Lord, help me. When he realizes we're just three years away, three more years, and we're going back to Jerusalem. Now, will you stay with me while I read this? Verse 3, chapter 9. Then I set my face. See, I want to read this, but I want to preach every verse, and that's going to take a long time. I set my face toward God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, Oh, Lord, great, awesome, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Wow. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Come on, church. Don't act like you're the only one left. Daniel was a good, righteous man, but he's repenting on behalf of. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name. Jeremiah warned them not to do this. Warned them to repent to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. Oh, Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But to us, shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off and all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of of the Lord our God. See, we don't even want to hear this, but this is the prayer that's going to get us to a place of victory again. To walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us, by bringing upon us a great disaster. Hello, COVID. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. And as is, is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. You can't sin and understand. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind, brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, how many have been brought out of the land of Egypt with them? 
and made yourself a name. Whenever God does anything in your life, it's to make himself a name. As it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Oh, Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your church. How many believe the church has really, I'm talking about the church general, has really turned their back on God? Your holy mountain. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are reproached to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary. Let me say it again. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary. Which is, and for your sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God. Incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city, the church, which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people, your church, are called by your Name, give God a praise and a shout if you'll make that your prayer. If God's people that are called by their name will humble themselves and pray and repent, God will send a move. Don't bother asking God to send revival when there's sin in the camp. Oh, hallelujah. I told you it's one of those messages. Are you okay? Not, not, not that I care. Colossians 4 2 says this from the Passion. Be faithful to. Be faithful to. As intercessors who are fully alert and giving thanks to God. Oh, I love that. First Peter 4 7. Come on, Peter. Since we are approaching the end of all things, be intentional purposeful, self-controlled, so that you can be given to prayer. There's an attitude. There's a way to approach prayer. And, and if you're not intentional, it, it, it's not just, you know, it's not only about how long you pray or when you pray or where you pray, but really a lot of that is important because you need to be intentional. Not occasional. And you need to be purposeful. I know what I'm doing and I know what I want to do and I know when I'm going to do it and I've got a prayer list and I'm focused. I know what I got to do. Come on. And self controlled. So I just don't have any of that. In God, you do. You have the fruit of His Spirit in you. And if you can be those three things, considering the end of time is near, you can be given to prayer. There's so many stories. Time won't allow me. I, I read one that just made me smile the other day. Uh, I, I don't know if you ever heard of John Wesley's mother, Susanna. Susanna Wesley. You know John Wesley, right? I mean, not personally. None of you are that old. 
You'd have to be like 150. You know? His mother had 19 children. One husband, one wife. 19 children. She raised every one of them to be godly. And she was called a woman of prayer. I'm thinking, 19 kids? He said, whenever Susanna wanted to pray, she would just take her apron and put it up over her head and sit in a chair. I could just see her. I got to pray. And whenever the kids saw her under the apron, they knew to leave her alone. Can you imagine raising 19 kids and everyone grew up to serve the Lord, including one of the greatest hymn writers, Charles Wesley, and one of the greatest preachers known throughout history, uh, John Wesley. Isn't that amazing? 19 children. Some of you can't handle two. You have one, you go, oh, God, I'm done. <laughs> oh, it's a different day we live in. Listen, Daniel was intentional, purposeful, self-controlled. We, we, we get a glimpse into how Daniel prayed. He had a place that he prayed in his room. He would open the window, open the curtains, and he would kneel, and he would be facing west. He would be facing where? Jerusalem. And every day, three times a day, the exact same time every day, he was one of the leading men in Babylon at this time. He had been promoted above the Babylonians. Listen, if you'll be faithful to God, he was constantly being promoted because he understood the times and could interpret dreams. But they said they got jealous and they said, we got to get rid of this guy. So they got around the king's thing and they made a rule that you can only pray to the Babylonian God. So what did Daniel do? He closed the curtains, shut the window, prayed silently under his breath, Lord Jesus. Well, he didn't say Jesus, but no. He said, I'm going to do what I always do. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. I am going to do what I have been intentional, purposeful, and self-controlled to do. It doesn't matter. You know, I'm sure somebody warned him, hey, <laughs> use wisdom. How many times how many times you heard people say that? Well, use wisdom, which is another way of saying compromise sometimes. He didn't use wisdom. He said, this is how I pray, and I'm not backing down. This is how I get a hold of my God, and I'm not quitting. This is what I've always done. This is what I feel led to do, and I'm not going to stop. So he prayed in the same direction, at the same window, with the same volume, at the same time. Off the same prayer list. And they were waiting for him. Somebody was sitting under the window. <laughs> and they ran to the king. <laughs> oh, Daniel's praying to Jehovah. And the king's like, oh, no. You got this new rule now. The king didn't think that through. You got this new rule. And they warned Daniel, Daniel, you got to stop doing this. Daniel said, look, I don't mean to offend you. I'm not in this to be ugly or offensive in any way. But this is between me and Yahweh. This is between me and Jehovah, and it will not change. Whew. I don't know what he prayed that day, but they caught him. And you know the story. You've heard about it in Sunday school. They made those lions really hungry, just like the devil's really hungry. And the world today wants to feed us to the lions. And they're hungry. That's why they roar. I don't know how many there were. One can kill you. We know there's more than one. We know there's a whole den of them, and they're hungry. They're looking for anything to eat. 
Now, Daniel wasn't overweight, but he was still attractive. So the king has him thrown into the lion's den. They roll the rock. Kind of reminds me when they rolled the rock on Jesus. Woo, glory to God. Well, the devil Daniel, well, he's dead now. Roll the rock. Post a watch. Seal the thing. So we've got, you know, that, you know, we're all in this together. And that rock is not going to move. Well, the rock didn't need to move because Jesus is the rock. And while they weren't looking, he slipped into the den all night long. The king loved Daniel. All night long, the king tossed and turned. Maybe his God will come through. Maybe his God will do something. I, let's see what happens. In the morning, they open it up, and Daniel walked out and said, Ta-da! It's in the Word. It's a, it's a Hebrew thing. <laughs> Five of you will go home and look that up tomorrow, this afternoon. And he said, oh, king, I never meant to offend you in any way, but you've got to know it was my God, not your God. Listen, they may pressure you to change your behavior, but you need to remember it is your God that will go in the lion's den. It is your God that, that got you saved. It was your God that healed your body. It was your God that got you that raise. It was your God that saved your loved ones. Ah, we don't ever want to get to the place where we look, where we come away from our God. And he said, oh, king, my God, shut the mouths of the lion. In the name of Jesus, I prophesy, shut your mouth, Babylon. God turned the lion's den into a petting zoo. Meow. He said, well, something was wrong with those lions. Uh, well, they threw the guys that threw him in there, and they ate them alive. Are you here? To, are you here? Are you listening? Whew. It's time to. It's time to pray, without compromise. What I'm saying, church, is there is a prayer today that we have never prayed before because we have a revelation today we've never had before. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There is a new prayer. It's the Daniel prayer. And if we'll get a hold of this, this is a time that no generation before us has faced. There have been harder times. There have been more difficult times. We've not even suffered yet unto blood. Except Will. <laughs> Bless his heart. Listen, listen, listen. We've not yet, uh, there have been harder times, but there's never been a time like this. We're the last generation. If the first generation is the, is the you know, we're the body of Christ. Y'all got a minute? If we're the body of Christ from the, from the beginning to all generations, right, the head's already in heaven. The neck, the chest, the legs, the whole body. We're the last generation. Are you getting this? The whole body is in heaven except the feet. And he says in Romans, I'm going to bruise Satan under your feet very shortly. We're the foot-stomping generation. And these boots are made for walking. I feel like preaching in another hour. Do it. I got one do it and 190. Get them out of here. Let me, let, me, let me close with this, which means I'm not done. But I, I guess the most famous uh, 
historian or the first uh, historian in world history to actually put a history of the world together and very respected. He's quoted uh, by everybody, Christian, Jew, uh, non-believer. Everyone quotes Josephus. He lived uh, right about the time that Jesus died. So he's back there. He relates the story about a Jew named Honi, (laughs) H-O-N-I. He was a Jew in the history of Jerusalem, and there was a drought. I think think it was like a three-year drought, and he made up his mind he's going to pray until it rains. And he went out outside the wall, and he began to pray, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and it didn't rain. Finally, he got down, and he got a stick, and he made a circle, and he said, God, I'm not leaving this circle until it rains. And he prayed. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. He just stood in his circle. He said, I'm not leaving until you answer my prayer and send rain. I think it's Mark Batterson wrote a book about it, The Circle Maker. You ought to get it, read it. He got in that circle, and, and, the, and the, Josephus says, Josephus, the historian, says, it began to drizzle. This is sometimes the devil knows the game is up, and he'll just give you a little bit, thinking you'll just take that and go. Listen, you know what you're praying for. Don't settle for anything else. Don't settle for one saved when you ask for your family to be saved. Don't, don't settle for partially healed when you need a complete healing. You need to stand on the word. Stay in your circle. I'm having trouble staying in my circle. It began to drizzle. And Honey looked up into heaven. He said, I did not pray for a light rain. I prayed for a heavy downpour from heaven. And all of a sudden, the heavens opened. And the rivers came back. And the cisterns came back. And the wells came back. God. I'm drawing a circle, and we're not leaving. It doesn't have to be a physical place. It could be just a place in your mind. I'm not leaving this place until you answer my prayer. Part of Honey's prayer is, we're the family of God. Send us rain. Send us revival. Send us a move of your spirit. Musicians, Jacob says, I won't let go until you bless me. I tell you, the enemy has fought me on this. I'm really glad I'm at the end. I'll not let go. Listen, you know your prayers are doing something when angels want to quit on you. When angels say, let me go. No, I won't let go until you bless me. Elijah told his servant, listen to me. I will close with this. Listen, Elijah tells his servant. It's going to rain. It hadn't rained in seven years. Can you imagine he says, go to, the, go to the cliff up there ahead and look. And he kept going. And he kept coming back. I don't see a thing. Kept going. I don't see a thing. Kept going. Why did Elijah keep sending him? Now, I can't prove this, but here's what I believe. I believe that cloud was always there. He just didn't recognize it as step one of God's blessing. Sometimes we just don't understand what he's doing, but it's the next phase that will get you to. Does that make sense? Finally comes back and he says, well, you know, I did see a little cloud. (laughs) Just a little cloud the size. I mean, surely that's not it. But I saw a little cloud. 
cloud about the size of a man's hand. Well, it wasn't a man's hand. It was God's hand. And Elijah says, I hear the abundance of rain. He heard it before his servant saw it. Church, listen to me. God's been telling you things. God's been speaking to you. He's been showing you little things. And sometimes we put it aside. Like, that's just a, listen, it's just a little cloud. There ain't nothing to that. I don't, that's not what I prayed for. That's okay. Because the drizzle will lead to the downpour. And the little cloud will lead to a dark cloud and a big sky full of rain clouds. Be thankful to God for the little things, for the initial things, for the step one, step two, step three things. But whatever you do, stay in your circle. Stand with me in Jesus' name. Rasha da 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 da